there's a lot of kismet going on because um, I don't know. I just felt connected from the very when first. We met. <laughs> yeah, me for too. For sure, for sure. And um, and I that, this is not bullshit. When the car came around. <laughs> And you leapt out <laughs> and were jumping down. I said, there she is. There was such that energy of yeah, joy. Yeah, you know? thank you. Uh, you know, it's my endeavor that as we sit here and discuss your book and your life and your career and, you know, hopefully a little bit of your personal life that, you know, I will get something that maybe you want to share that maybe you haven't before. By your saying it, um, I now... I'm forced to look back and see how blessed I've been uh, with with my career. Um, if I and I, I did write this book where I tripped down memory lane, mm -hmm. but there were so many moments from so long ago mm -hmm. that were huge to me mm -hmm. that I was so blessed. That I got to come and play in this business. Yeah. I mean, not everybody gets that dream. Right. You know, we all, right. as children, we all have dreams of being in show business. I'm going to be an actress. Or even worse, I'm going to be a star, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with being an actress. Right. Um, but now that you're questioning me, I'm having to look back. Mm -hmm. Because it feels like some of it was so long ago. Yeah, I imagine. And, and probably while you were writing the book, you were right. sort of reliving it. and I was. But know? talking to you makes it even um, well, more intimate. Mm -hmm. How do you think your early childhood, which was, you had affluence on one side, right? Mm -hmm. and, and not on the other. Right. So that as a child is kind of trying to figure out where, you know, where you fit into that, but how do you think that dynamic in the house affected your coming up, I guess? Well, in, I was raised in a big, beautiful, I guess you'd call it today a palatial home mm -hmm. in Hancock Park, um, but, and it was my grandparents, my grandmother's home, mm -hmm. and I was always aware, not in a bad way, but it, they were the ones who had the money. Right. I had no money of my own. I was blessed that I got to be raised in this beautiful area, and but it had really nothing to do with my value. Amazing. Well, I, I mean, amazing I didn't that you recognize that. No. Yes, I was grateful. I had right. a great time. You know, right. we had a badminton court and a tetherball court and a swimming pool, and everybody came over and. And, and as you in the book, you know, I went to Cotillion. I did all that stuff that was expected. But it was because of them, not because of me. Um, and wow. that wasn't a bad thing. It just sort of came with the dinner. But I knew it had nothing to do with my worth or my... Contribution. Right, my contribution. I'm, I'm a product of my times. Mm -hmm. And... Um, my family and my friends and and the, the morals and the mores of that era. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel so fortunate yeah. that I lived and was born when I did because mm -hmm. I was born right after, right in the middle of World War II. Mm -hmm. So, and the country was so filled with promise yeah. and hope yeah. for a new future. Mm after the war ended, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and there was an, an, another world opening to people like me mm -hmm. and my parents, and you can get a refrigerator. And, right. You know, I mean, it yeah. was just filled with promise and dreams, and, and there was hope. There was hope. I shouldn't say that, because obviously there's another group of people in our country who were not as blessed as right, I was. But, but, right. Were you aware that you were in a, um, that you grew up in a Hollywood, old Hollywood home, for no. lack of a better word? No, because my grandfather, although he was very famous, 
in his day. Right. It was the golden, I think they call it the golden days of Hollywood. Right. And, um, and to be repetitive, just for this interview, mm -hmm. he was Cecil B. DeMille's, Louis B. Mayer's, mm -hmm. um, uh, Howard Hughes, Howard Hughes, attorney, mm -hmm. Lana Turner's, Catherine Hepburn, everybody, everybody, everybody at that time, yeah. Um, and as I grew up, as I got older, I, I realized what he did. But he no longer lived in that house. My grandparents separated, mm -hmm. so he was never around much. Mm. Um, I saw him once a year. Wow. On Christmas morning. He'd, uh, we'd go to his home on sunset. Mm -hmm. And this was the, the, the dichotomy of my life. I mean, you know, right, that's what I'm saying. That's nice kind of Catholic what I'm getting school, to. You know, yeah. I wore school uniforms and I you know, had banged up knees. And, yeah. And, um, but I was just a normal child, really. I was. I did have these um, advantages. I, I knew of his fame, and I knew of you know the celebrity that surrounded it, but I never experienced. Probably it. saved you, in some ways, to oh, not I'm to, sure, to right? really. No, I'm not the child of a famous right, person. and yet you were exposed to it. But you also went to Cecil B. DeMille's house. I did go to and Mr. That was DeMille's kind house. Of an amazing story. In my because, Mary Jane's. Yeah, I did, and that was exciting because yeah. I loved movies. Right. I knew who Mr. DeMille was. Right. But. I didn't know he was Cecil B. DeMille, do you know? Right. He was just Mr. DeMille. Right. How would you have yeah. that context? But I remember it enough to tell it in my book and mm -hmm. to repeat it to you. Yeah. That, um, yeah, yeah we, were, we were allowed into worlds like that. Right. And as a kid, that really does leave right. an impression. It also, I think, you know, makes you kind of strive for attaining maybe more or wanting that, you know, when you're exposed to those things as a kid, right? Because oh. you had dynamics right. as a little girl. Right. That you, you had to really highly navigate. Highly criticized. Yeah. Criticized yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think I am a people pleaser. So I worked really hard at pleasing my grandmother. And you've had a challenging, I would say, you know, challenging characters in your life. And that's not easy for a little girl to navigate. It's true. Right? And Grimmy was a big character and, and she caused she you some huge. bit of stress in your life. Yes, and she then did. my aunt my aunt told my grandmother one day. My aunt told me this in my adult life. She said, I used to tell your grandmother Marguerite, you've got to go easier on this one. You're too hard on her. And you're gonna do some damage. So did you did you think she did some damage and what damage did she do? No. Hmm. Didn't think you were going to say that. I don't think she did any damage. No, I am a result right of who she was. Um I <clears throat> benefited certainly from the things that she gave me. Mm -hmm. Um my favorite story. It's one in the book. But it totally epitomizes her. And may I tell it to you? Yeah, please. It's in the book, but it, this is the essence of who she was. She put me in a private boarding school. And one day she decides, she said, I don't like the tone you're getting from that fancy school of yours. You know, those boarding school girls talk through their teeth, you know, she yeah. started to detect that in me. I don't like the tone you're getting from that fancy school of yours. So when everybody else was off doing ski weekends, my family never skied, we're so LA, you know, <laughs> doing these fancy ski weekends, she said, and I was underage. At 15, you could not legally work right. in California. I didn't have a social security card. She got me, under the table, a job at Bullock's Wilshire, a very fancy store. Story, yeah. And she bought me my black skirt that I had to wear, and I was fat, and my hose. Uh, and they weren't pantyhose in those days. They were, you know, right, the garters the and the bucket, stuff yeah. where if you're fat, your thighs hang over. Mm -hmm. And the black <laughs> and the black heels. That's fun. And the white blouse, bullocks, uh, what they asked you to wear. And I was what was known as a page. And it was Christmas Eve. And I stood on these hard marble floors. I don't know if you remember that beautiful old store, Bullocks mm -hmm. Wilshire, an Art Deco store downtown. I stood on these hard marble floors. On the, the first floor was a perfume 
all the very, very expensive perfumes um, being sold on Christmas Eve, men buying them for their wives and their mistresses, right. but it was busy. And every time one needed to be wrapped, one of the salesmen would snap her fingers at me. Paige, oh Paige, come here Paige. So I went over and I got my package and I took it to Miss So and Mr. So like a gift wrapped, please, as quickly as possible. So I'd go halfway across the store on these marble floors with my fat <laughs> hanging over my hose, <laughs> uh, getting it wrapped and bringing it back. Thank you, Paige. Oh, Paige. Yeah. Snapping their fingers at me, ordering me around. And I was getting a cold. And my mom had dropped me off at the back of the store in the morning and I thought she was going to come to the back of the store to pick me up. Well, up pulls my grandmother in a town car, chauffeur, she's in the back seat. And I was so broken down mm -hmm. by the end of the day mm -hmm. because I hadn't built up my balls yet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I crawled in the back of the car and I put my head down on the seat, not certainly on her lap, but I put it my head on her seat and I just started sobbing. My thighs were bleeding from f fat rubbing together. I had a terrible cold. I'd been ordered around with no respect. Just, and I just wept. And she said to me, I thought it was time you learned how the other half lived. Mm. Mm. And I loved her so much. At that point, because I did need to know how the other half lived. Yeah. I was a very privileged kid, you know, and I'd, I'd never worked before, but I was a good girl. I was polite. I did my job. Mm -hmm. But when she said those words to me, I thought it was time you learned how the other half mm -hmm. lived. Wow. I realized I was becoming some snotty little snob in this fancy girl school. Yeah. And I never went that way again. Yeah. That's valuable. My tone changed. Yep. <laughs> but it did. La dee da. Um, yeah. My tone changed, and I never. I'm ashamed to tell you I was going in that direction. Right. But, you know. Was... So, so what you're saying is, is really having Grimmy as your as that character in your life. Really, you you walked away with the best of it. The greatest snob I knew at age 15 called me a snob. When she said, I thought it was time you learned how the other yeah. half lived. Wow. What was the dynamic like between your mother and father in the house? Were they kind to each other? Were they I don't remember them ever being physically affectionate. Wow. Um, they weren't cold to right. each other. Um, my mother tried to protect us, you know, from knowing that there was any unhappiness, but clearly there was, Yeah. you know. and. With all the protection she did, you you can't spare the child. You know, we're, yeah. we all live in the same house. Right. But I never heard them arguing. That's a bonus. My mother made sure that we'd never hear any arguing. Amazing. And she'd say, "Darling, your father and I are not. We were not having a fight. We were merely having a discussion." Right. I don't know. If, I don't know if that's harmful or not. Because well, it, it's inauthentic, it, it, and the well, child what always it did knows. Was it sustained me. Yeah. It sustained me for those years. Right. Then, when the end, end of the marriage came, and I was fourteen, which is such a raw age for a yeah. girl, um, I I was devastated. There's no consoling. Me. That's a very raw age I to go through that. To die. Yeah. But I got over it. I imagine, and, and probably while you were writing the book, you were right. sort of reliving it. And I was, but know? talking to you makes it even um, well, more intimate. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you write now. I do. I, I heard that I you said I did not enjoy <laughs> being a writer. No, you said I hated. Right. I hate I being a writer, being but author. I like being an author. Yes. <laughs> which I thought was kind of I amazing. I don't know if I could do it again. Well, seven years is a long time, yeah. you know, to, to pour into something, you know? Well, now I know how to go for help, but I tried it all by myself. Well, yeah. Forget that. Yeah. You know, we yeah. all have our skills, and they are all my words, but to form every yeah. paragraph, and the Simon and Schuster were telling me, your paragraphs are too short. Right. I said, well, that's how short my story is. <laughs> right. <laughs> I said, right. Well, Sharon, we need, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So 
I learned. Uh -huh. I learned, uh -huh. and and they, you know, spanked, and mm -hmm. and I responded mm -hmm. and got help. We don't do any of this alone. When you're writing, when you're writing your 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 book, it seems it seems to me like you really. Um, you really let it all go, and you really, <laughs> really, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a tell-all, but I, I... You should have seen the stuff I didn't put in. I, yeah, I want to know about, like, like how, were you nervous about that? Like, and were you, like, nervous, okay, well, if I write that scene about, like, being in the trailer with Tyne and, you know, holding up the, the whole, you know, production, like... Like, were you nervous? Like, okay, can I put Was that I in? Did you call in her? The story? Yeah, like, no. uh, amazing. No. I'd lived it. I'd lived it. I had survived it, and it was kind of a cool story. A very cool. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> I'm like, sure. Wow. Said you had to tell that story. Yeah. You couldn't check with me first. Yeah. But that's that's. I guess that's what I'm asking. Because right. there was a few I of did those. I feel sort of a little hesitant about that, but. Um, but it was a good one, and it there, really made me think. Oh my God, that. Like I felt, that I was like sweating, thinking about, oh my God, I could totally imagine that. Like you're running lines and you're, you know, letting loose a little bit. And next thing you know, you're like, what do you do? You know, and it just, I felt like I was in the room. And I felt Thank that you. way through the whole book. Thank I mean, it's you. like feeling like, I know you've had that, um, you've had that review of like, like it's like being with your girlfriend. And that's really what the book feels like. You know, it's just like well, we're having a drink together. Like. <laughs> Yeah, it totally does. But, you know, I, I haven't spoken to anybody at length, like I am with you, right. really about the book. You know, yeah. my interviews are short, or it's, yeah. it's, it's a Zoom thing, or, right. or, or right. a newspaper interview. And, and right. um, But this is the first time I've really had the intimacy of yeah. doing this with well, somebody. Well, we're, we're so really happy. Who's not stroking me. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad that you feel that way. Well, we're excited about you writing another book. I'm sure there's a lot that you haven't shared, but you did share a lot about... I did. You did, and I, and I really honor you in that because it's not easy to do, but I think there's so much wisdom that as we age and we mature that people can glean from, and if we hold it so close, no one really gets to learn. So I... I just really appreciate that you talked about like the affair, what you were going through while that was happening. You know, I really sort of like thought, wow, you know, I that mean, must have been hard to be in love with somebody and it can't be, you right. know, uh, expressed and there's shame around it, but mm -hmm. it's your heart. I mean, not easy to navigate. And you're the. And it happened. And it happens. Yeah. It happened. And if I'm going to tell the story of my life, I'm going to tell the truth. I mean, there are some things that good taste just forbids. <laughs> you right, know? right. I, 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 I filled it in with my imagination, <laughs> though. Um, um, at first, when I was first writing it, and I was starting to get into my sexual life, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, my favorite line that I came up with was, um, um, in my era... Oh, it was about your reputation. Right. My grandmother used to say, if there's one thing you ever lose, there's one thing if you ever lose it, you can never get it back again. And I said, what is that? And she said, your reputation. Hmm. Well, I wrote, I thought it was such a brilliant line. I wrote, in my era, <laughs> your reputation lasted as long as your hymen did. <laughs> because I was raised in the era where uh, boys didn't, think you were a nice girl if you put out. Yeah. They, the, 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 they never married those girls. Yeah. yeah. I was raised with that belief. Yeah. Do you know? So I had to fake my virginity. Yeah. <laughs> I was too. Couple I loved times. that part about, uh, just about how, like, you're very open about your sexuality. And then uh, when I learned... Um, I don't. I, I don't even I was know. I just if trying to get along. You know? Yeah, and I no, swear I to know. God, you were just know, trying you just, to live your life. I just want people to like yeah, me. And, yeah. Yeah. So I would accommodate. Right. Right. By faking my virginity at right. the time. Right. Just because I you really had to. cared about the boy and I didn't right. want him to think I was some tramp. Right. You know. Right. Hard to it's grow so, up that I mean, way. Imagine people saying that in this day and age. Right. But 
I'm a product of that dating. So I, I am still too. feel it. I, I'm, I'm sort of interested. I'm always thinking about like, you know, just just the whole idea of sexuality and how you deal with your own sexuality and mm -hmm. I, you know I'm always asking myself well you know what is that like or you know what would that be like and is that something that you've thought about in your sexuality like you and and when you met Rosie and you had that experience did you go oh, okay well hmm. well thank God she turned me down <laughs> <laughs> but yes I did approach her um, I love it. I had grown to love her yeah. so much. Yeah. And we just got really close about a tragedy I had gone through and she knew about it. Um, it, it anyway. And so we were at dinner one night having dinner and I, and I dreamt about her the night before. And in my dream I loved her so and I don't, didn't remember ever having that feeling for a while. Oh, woman. that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. I loved her so much in the dream. Yeah. And so we were having dinner, and I probably had a couple shooters. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I was still and sober. I don't remember. Mm. But I said, you know, I can't remember how I said it to her, but I told her that I said, I've really grown to love you so much. Yeah. And um, I don't mean to embarrass you, but do you think, She's so, for God's sake, Glessy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. For God's sake, Glessy, you're so straight. God, no. Yeah. I said, oh, really? Yeah. She said, oh, no. she said, thank you. But no, not, not because she found me unattractive. She just knew it was just you were straight. wouldn't fly. You right, know? right. But I had such emotional feelings for her. And at that time, I'd never had those feelings for a woman. Yeah, no, I understand. I had a dream about a friend of mine uh, too, um, that I never, and I still have never been able to capture that feeling of love that yes. I had in the dream. Right. And I, uh, it, and I was, and I came to into waking life, and I thought, wow, that's must maybe in a, even a past life with this person, but Could've that been. feeling. Yeah, it was. I've never been able to. I capture. woke up in love. Yeah. I woke right, up that right. morning like in love with this person, and I have to tell her. Yeah. And I thought that that should translate into sex, you know? Right. Oh, for God's sake, Leslie. <laughs> right. Right. And, and well, fortunately, she was wiser than right. I. I have a very best friend now in my life. Very, very dear friend. She's gay, and a lot of people think we're lovers. We're yeah. not. Why but not? She's it doesn't my matter. dearest, dearest, closest, closest friend. Yeah. I, I, I was saying uh, to a friend recently, just, I always found it very uh, empowering to hear or to know a woman who seemed to be very clear about not wanting children, right? Mm -hmm. It's rare, right? But when I've met women in my life, and I have one in my family, in my immediate family, where they're just very clear that they don't want children, I've always been very intrigued and kind of uh, hold that in high regard. Because it's not easy to make that decision. You've got to live with it for the rest of your life. And there was no arrogance about it. I wasn't arrogant about it. I know myself. I, right. I just knew, I thought, I had a really swell mom. And I knew that being a mother, I think, is the most overwhelming, <laughs> responsible yeah. Yeah. job to raise and form another human being. I couldn't take it on. I couldn't take it on. And then later I knew I wanted to be an actress. And I wanted to do it well. And I knew I couldn't do that well and right. this well. Right. I just wasn't so capable it was a practical of it. I'm decision. an all or nothing person. And you never regretted it? Never. Never. I, I, never. Amazing. Because I don't think I would have done the job well enough. And I've seen the result of a job being done well. Right. And I've seen the result of the job not, not being, being done, done well. Yeah. What's happening for women right now is astounding. It's astounding. Me. And I don't know, well, anyway, I don't mean to be negative, but it's disgusting. I'm old enough to have known when abortion was illegal. Fortunately, I've never been pregnant. God knew. Yeah. God, God is new. No, not this one. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I am from that era where my friends did have abortions on their kitchen table. Mm. And the fetus left in the wastebasket. And with this, it's about to happen. We're going back to that. Yeah, it's hard to believe. It's and really women dying, hard to believe. Women dying. Sorry. Don't mean to be. No. No, it's it's just so disgusting, it's so stupid, and so moronic, and and we're back in the fucking dark ages. Who are these people? Yeah, they've come so far. But yeah, I know, I know. It, it's it's, and I think for a lot of us, it's hard to. Um, it's almost too much to handle, psych psychically, I know. Yes. you know, and emotionally. Right. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, 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 no. But it's, it's okay. But this is the world I'm living in yeah. now, mm -hmm. and I'm proud of what Cagney and Lacey was able to do. And, yeah. and I lived in the era where we made Roe versus Wade happen. Yes. You know. Yes. Anyway, did you realize when you were doing Cagney and Lacey, or when did you realize is the question that that show and your character? had that kind of impact on women? Like, would you remember the moment you were like, oh my God. Actually, I do remember the moment, but it was not while I was shooting it. We were shooting, <clears throat> we'd started out, you know, together and shooting sometimes 18 hours a day. Yeah. The show was devised so that one of us was always on screen. <sighs> always, that was, that was, it was fashioned that way. Mm -hmm. Usually both of us, but always one of us. So the hours were long, and, and um, I didn't really, and when you shoot on a sound stage, you, it's not like you're on, 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 not on a theater where people are applauding. We right. didn't know, I mean, what was it, 35 million a week tuned in to watch us? I mean, that's yeah. Super Bowl numbers, for God's sake. Right. But we didn't know. Right. Barney knew those numbers, but it didn't mean anything to us. Right. We didn't understand right. what that meant. <clears throat> we just had work to do and, and really good scripts we were given. And like any actress of value who cares about her work, you care about the, the, the product and, and how you present it and how you work with your partner. That was where we were focused. Yeah. And we did end up on the well, Ms. Magazine. It, uh, Gloria Steinem d d defended us and brought us to the fore. And, yeah. and we had help like that from outside press people who said people need to know about this. But again, we didn't know the power we were having with women personally, Yeah, you know, Yeah, out there. Right. And maybe it was year five, I don't remember. It was, we, there was a March on Washington. I think it was against the young Bush, the Women's March on Washington. Right. And Tyne, they put us in the front row with the banner, you know, and, it was there with Whoopi Goldberg and Gloria Steinem, and, and I was not as educated about the movement. Right. Um, I just showed up. I just always showed up. <laughs> right. Sure, I'm there, I'm there. And so we did, and, and hundreds of thousands of women and a few guys, Barney Rosenzweig being one of them, marched with us. And so we got to this arena, this stage, and we're backstage, and again, I'm just totally, hmm. And there's the Washington Monument, you know, just like the president's inauguration, and hundreds of thousands of women, but I didn't know until I walked out on stage. I didn't even know where I was. <laughs> I knew I was in Washington, and I held the banner to do this great march, and Gloria says, go out there. I said, go out there, go. She said, go out there, you and time. I said, what do we say? Nobody's written anything for us. I mean, you know, it's right. up. What do we say? She said, don't say anything, just walk out. Oh, it's Gloria fucking Steinem, you know? So, we took Tyne's hand and we walked out, scared, you know? I didn't know what, and these women started screaming and clapping and and I got it. Then you knew. I got it. I said, I think I turned to time because we weren't mic'd. You know, the, the, she, Gloria said, just walk out. And I got 
I think I turned to Ty and said, I think we've had some impact. You know, I mean, it just was yeah. so astounding to me. Yeah, it's a big moment. It was like, it's one of the biggest moments in my life. Yeah. I'll and bet. I didn't say that in the book. That was one of the biggest moments of my life. Yep. But as I tell it to you, yep. and I see how I was honored by these people that I didn't even know. I just was lucky to have these great scripts in that the sound stage and those writers and totally and then Barney and right? Barney and Barney finest television producer I've ever worked with right and, and I've done a lot of them right absolutely I mean, I've had a lot of them I mean I've worked with <laughs> right. a lot of them and he is by far not because he's my husband but I've had a lot of experience yes you have and he's just he was just totally in our lives it was the three of us it was Barney and Tyne and me because I've seen you guys in interviewed together, and he, he seems rather lovely, but, he is. but strong. Um, how do I describe Barney? He, um, he's, he says how he feels. And sometimes that hurts. Yeah. Sometimes it hurts my feelings. And um, I wasn't as good in our early marriage. I didn't bounce well. I wasn't used to being frankly talk to that way. Right. <laughs> you know, right. when I was his Cagney, you know, I was, I was worship. Yeah. Right. But when I became his wife, <laughs> it became a whole different bag. Was he the one that, who decided, because I think this is very cool, that you both had equal billing, which actually was really smart on Yeah, it was the only part. disagreement Tyne and I had. <laughs> and really, you know, people wanted to make if the press yeah. would try to say that we were like cats on the stage. No, we weren't. They always try Women to say are that. not like that. Do you know? Well, maybe some are. But I mean, human generally, yeah, we're not. We were not at all. We knew the fate of this show depended on us. Right. And right. we were totally together. We needed each other. Time had been playing Lacey for two times now without me. Right. Right. I'm right. stepping in. I'm saying, right. sorry, I'm taking first billing. Well, come on. And so Barney was the one who came up with the idea to switch it yeah. every week. It cost them a fortune. <laughs> I know, but that's, a, that's the, the power of Barney. I had been in many series by the time I had come to Cagney and Lacey. And Tyne's background was Broadway. You know, yeah. She was a great theater yeah. actress. I had seen her on Broadway oh, as yeah. a kid. Oh, yeah. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful actress. Yeah. I was intimidated at first when I was, you know, booked with her. And, um, and my background was television. And I'd been billed over the title. Right. A few times. And so now it came to discuss billing. <laughs> and I said, absolutely, I'd, I'd love this. Of course, I'd like first billing. I understand that you don't bill over the title on this show. It's fine, but of course, I want first billing. Well, what am I talking about? Ty Daly had already played Lacey twice without Okay, me. I want to talk about that, too, because I saw, I didn't know that Loretta Swit. Loretta Swit. And then I, wait, and Meg Foster. Yes. Talk to me. Wait, because we're now we're we're, we're tan being tangential. But that was the first incarnation of the show, or how did what Meg Foster? No. And uh, Loretta. Swig? I I did, did Barney Rosenzweig went to his at the time girlfriend, soon to be his wife, Barbara Corday, and her writing partner Barbara Avedon, and said, "I want to do Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with two women." Right. That was his idea. And he hired them to write an hour drama starring two women that were that personality, right. you know. And um, it came out to be this show called Cagney and Lacey. And at the time, if they, after they had written it, I was doing a series called um, Turnabout, where I played a man trapped inside a woman's body. And John Shuck played a woman trapped inside a man's body. It wasn't a hit, but we had a great time. <laughs> but the story editors on it were Barbara Corday and Barbara Avedon. They were our little story editors on our series. Wow. And so they'd asked to come to meet me and want to know how I felt, how I wanted them to write for my character. I don't know. <laughs> you know, you're the writer. And Barbara Corday, Barney's lady at the time, went home to Barney and he said, she said, I found Cagney. He said, really? He said, I found the girl who should play Cagney. He said, well, let's take a look. So she ran 
turnabout. He said, it's not right for Cagney. <laughs> so, God. so then, maybe a few months later, maybe four months later, I had played Carol Lombard. In my favorite. Yeah, she thanks. was my favorite. Yeah, me too. The old Hollywood. And I was very fortunate to be able to play Carol yeah. Lombard in Moviola, The Scarlet O'Hara Wars. And Barney and Barbara were at a screening of it. You know, when they used to have the big screenings. Yeah. And Barney turns to Barbara and he says, Well, there is Cagney. <laughs> she said, Barney, <laughs> that's Sharon Glass, the one I tried to recommend right. before. He said, well, I like her better like this. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And that's how I got it. Right. And then it was presented to me, and for various reasons, I said no. Barney's reason is actors are not always the best judges of material. Well, that's probably true. Right. So I said no, and they got Loretta to do the TV movie. Then it sold as a series, and Loretta had to go back to Mash. To Mash. Yeah. So Barney calls again. And he said, the series, it's going to series. Will you play Cagney? And my manager said, I'm sorry, Barney, dear, but Sharon, and I went to replace Lynn Redgrave in another series. Right. So I wasn't available. And besides, Cagney and Lacey was not a universal show. And, and Universal so did not allow their contract players to do a series off the lot. They could do other things, like Lombard was off with, was with Warner Brothers. Right, that's but, but series had to stay on the Universal Lot. Interesting. Lock. So I couldn't, and they uh, got Meg Foster, wonderful, beautiful. I love her. Those yeah. crazy eyes. Yeah, crazy eyes. And uh, she played Cagney, and they got canceled after I think four episodes. They shot six, and they got canceled after four. And they told Barney, "We'll give you one more chance, but you have to recast Cagney." So he said, well, how about Sharon Glass? <laughs> and they said, if you can get her. I was in a series for them with Lynn Red, I, replacing Lynn Redgrave. So Barney gets on the plane, flies to New York where they're having the meetings to find out the next seasons. Right. And he's standing out there waiting to find out what CBS is going to do with their series. Right. And they look at Barney and say, Barney, go away. We're not talking to you. He said, all I want to know is his house calls right. on the schedule. Right. They said, no. He said, great. Right. <laughs> so he calls Monique James and he says, Monique, it's Barney Rosen's right calling for the third time to invite Sharon Gless to play Cagney. Amazing. She said, I told you, Barney, dear, Sharon's in a series. He said, bet me she's in a series. <laughs> she just got her ass canceled. I watched a lot of Cagney and Lacey over the last couple of weeks and, and I... It, 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 you're acting, and I'm not blowing smoke, it, it was very high level. You know, it was not TV acting. You, what you were doing was something um, more sophisticated, more grounded. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank Come you. on. For sure. I, no, I'm serious. Yeah. I mean, it just was like, you know, you, oftentimes you see 70s and 80s TV and the acting is stylized or right. whatever. And yours would translate today. You know, well, beautifully. That's nice. I hope so. Absolutely. Um, I mean, really translate. And that that alcoholic scene. That I was, was really proud of that. You, you sh I mean. That I was very proud of. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't drunk when I did them. Yeah, I didn't think so. I loved the fact that <laughs> well, you said. Well, the press said his life imitating art, you yeah. know, because I was in Hazleton in Rio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those famous drunk scenes. Yeah. It that was must in have the paper is life imitating yeah. art. That was the exact quote. But did it trip off? I mean, we're kind of going all over the place. But I think, you know, I thought to myself, you know, when you, when Barney introduced that concept, I thought it quite sophisticated of him to think about doing that kind of storyline and having you do that and introducing alcoholism in that way at that time. I think, yes. And there'd never been a series where the hero, I was one of two heroes, where yeah. the hero has a disease, and I don't mean cancer, because Tyne Daly's character did have cancer, right. and he dealt with that right. on the air, right. and introduced the concept of a, of a lumpectomy, which had never been heard of. In those Amazing. days, your breasts were just cut off. Right. That's how it went. And we introduced the fact that there is a procedure called the lumpectomy, where only the lump has to be removed. Right. And we were proud of that. But a disease, and when I mean a disease like alcoholism, uh, where people frown on it. Yeah. Do you know, they yeah. never had he a hero of a series get 
a it disease like get that. Get challenged you know? yeah, in well, that way. Yeah, they have no control. Right. They make a mess right. of themselves and embarrass themselves. Right. When we did research on that, on the addressing Christine, uh, we, it, we did research that divulged when men get drunk, uh, they're amusing. They're fun. <laughs> right. When a woman gets drunk, she's an embarrassment. Oh, that's interesting. I always remember those two sentences. That's interesting. And um, so it was, a, it was a, an honor to, to address that issue. She'd been boozing for five years already. Right. She was always had a drink in her hand, either right. with her father or whoever she was sleeping right. with. She was the social drinker. Oh, yeah. She was the social drinker. Right. And when we addressed the, the depth of her disease yeah. is when we went inside her apartment and shut the door. Yeah. And turn the camera on. Probably been going on for years, but we'd never gone inside with it. It's really powerful. You were in a rehab. I, 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 I mean, I was kind of laughing at the story of how your friend picked you up and then <laughs> you guys got made, or you hit every bar on your way to rehab, which I thought oh. was kind <laughs> of incredible. Judith you know, Dan. it was just funny, you know. I know it's not funny, <laughs> but the way you, the way you, way you told it was really funny and and but but you didn't realize you know because you didn't drink while you worked and you didn't no. drug and drink while you worked which which was amazing so right. you really well, didn't was, I mean amazing that, that it didn't affect your work no I, I until I wasn't I, I swear I wasn't that good <laughs> I mean I was a good actress but I wasn't that good that I could mess with my time yeah I agree and I agree with that I knew booze would throw I feel my the same way off. yeah you, you know what one made me when, when, I, when I used to dream about being an actress, when I was little and television first came into, mm -hmm. you know, I used to sit with my nose just against it. <laughs> in the Oscars. Yeah. When the Oscars came on. Huge. I can't tell you. Bob Hope was always the host every year in his white tie and tails and the, the black tie and tails. And, and, um, and every every year at Oscar time, I'd sit right up next to that television and sing da 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 because that's the song they used to right. play to right. open the Oscars every year. And to see all those beautiful women in those gowns, and I didn't understand the, the great honor. I knew it was an award show, right. but it was just the beauty of it and the it doesn't exist anymore like right. that. I know. You know I'm we're sounding just, like we were, the old we were, part I am. No, but I mean, we were just talking about that. Those days are yeah. long gone. But I was exposed just enough to it right. to remember it mm -hmm. and to see the Klieg lights. Right. It, my house, the Klieg lights went across the sky in Hollywood uh -huh. because there was a, pre a premiere going on on That's Hollywood exciting. Boulevard. I didn't go to the premieres every June, <laughs> but I knew what they were. <laughs> right. And those were, maybe it's just a surface, you know, I mean, of course. God knows the publicity departments at these studios covered up all kinds of crap. Right. Um, what, I know that somebody was that your grandfather gave you $600 or $500 to take acting lessons. But where did you really $150. Release... Oh, I was going to say 600 was a lot. That's the number I got. I was like, that was, well, that was very nice of him. I had nothing. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and it was $150 to... To go to an acting class. And who did you go to? Like, where did you get your, your acting chops from? Well, I think from a higher source. Okay, that's what I thought you were going to say. Because the acting coach I went to when I signed at Universal, they made me stop studying with her. Because they said, we don't like what happens. In you get tampered with, and then you're yeah, not as good. Yeah, she said, I'd, yeah. I'd rather you just be left alone Beautiful. For now. That was beautiful advice from well, her. Well, eventually I did get a, a wonderful wonderful coach, a Russian gentleman named uh -huh. George Stanoff. Um, uh, Anton Chekhov, Michael Chekhov, I beg your pardon. Michael Chekhov dedicated his book to the actor. He dedicated it to George Stanoff. Wow. And Mr. Stanoff used to call me the professor. <laughs> he was very Russian. And uh, he said, get out of here. Yeah. I want you yeah. in here, professor. Right. Did you feel like you were connected to your spirituality when you were working and when you were acting? Like at what point did you kind of, because you just said your your, you feel like your gift, your your ability to act comes from, 
a higher source, right? Yes, I do. But when I was first starting acting, I wasn't studying metaphysics as intensely as I eventually did. Mm -hmm. um, so, as Monique said, I think you've been acting all your life. We're just going to start paying you for <laughs> it, right? Um, I believe that as I became more into my spiritual studies, my mm -hmm. spiritual search, mm -hmm. that somebody came in and taught me what to do, what was appropriate, and I believe I improved as I went, because experience is everything, everything. of course. Yeah. Um, but there were times when I would ask for help with a scene that would be difficult. Yeah. And it would just come. A scene that maybe was emotionally difficult, because it's real easy for me to tap dance, you know. Totally. Oh, yeah. But then when you have to do a scene that's emotionally difficult, and I was not trained. You imagine how your grandmother dying 20 years ago, and that's going to do it. You don't. Right. It's, it's, it's a bullshit. Whatever. Right. Because um, it's not reliable. <laughs> um, right. And, but sometimes when I just ask, God, God is my higher self. Anybody who's listening, please help me. I don't know how to get there, mm -hmm. but I want to. And sometimes really wonderful scenes would happen that people still show today. That's lovely. Yeah. That's lovely. One day when I was doing the really heavy, heavy drunk stuff, and Barney was a good enough producer where he shot everything in sequence. So right. I would know how drunk I was and how far right. I that had was to go. That was nice. And Jack Purcell, the channel for Lazarus, came by the set Hello. <laughs> Out of nowhere, he drops by the set. He wow. never comes to the set. Ever. He came by the set, hung out with me in my trailer. And I kept just, excuse me, Jack, you know, I had to keep rehearsing this tragic part of the scene of saying goodbye to my father when I was a child, waving, and he never saw me wave. It's a very tender scene. Mm. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. And also, I'm supposed to be drunk and do this scene, right. the reminiscing. And Jack just kept listening to me and listening to me do it, listening to me do it. And um, he came to the set. He watched me do it once. Obviously, we did many versions. And he left. That's and, amazing. And what I really a great believe story. that Lazarus obviously was there. Jack yeah. was there. My higher self was there. People I don't. I'm not ready to see yet. Right. You know? Right. But somebody came. Yeah. So your spiritual practice grew from that. It did. And thanks to Lazarus, a lot of my um, a lot of my professional decisions, my next series or my next job or whatever, I would ask him. Yeah. And he would tell me how what he thought would be good for me or why. And um, so when Jack stopped doing the the channeling, you yeah. know, I was sort of on my own, but I yeah, think I'd had been led base. certainly by Monique base. James, the woman yeah. who signed me at Universal, yeah. Yeah. by her leading me and other people who were so effective in my career, and then Lazarus teaching me that I have to do this. It's like, it's all me. Yeah. It isn't my grandmother. I walked away from that seminar. I was on an airplane. And I walked away from that seminar on the plane thinking, I don't have to blame her anymore. Yeah. I'm not a child. I don't have to blame her that I'm not good enough or I am good enough. You could, you could set that down power. finally. And she never told me I wasn't good enough. Right. Do you know that was my interpretation of right. her criticism? Right. But he taught me that I'm responsible. It's on my shoulders, and I can't tell you what a weight was lifted off of me yeah. knowing it's all me. I can't control anybody else. 
I thought I could, you know? Right. And, you know, maybe not succeed because they didn't like me. But he taught me that I can get anything I want if I really want it. And if not, you don't get it, then check with the other people inside of you who are saying, ah, we're not ready. Because <laughs> he used to say, your five-year-old child just really doesn't want to be the chairman of the Board of General Motors. They really don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> and sometimes we let our child's fear, right. you know, uh, yeah. stop us from... Anyway, I didn't mean to lecture about it. No, it's this. beautiful. But it changed my life. It, and it changed my life uh, to this day. I mean, thank you so much for inviting me and getting me to talk about this because... Yeah. I don't really have anybody to talk about with the metaphysics anymore. Yeah, you know? I, I, I don't know what I would be like on a daily if I didn't have uh, the ability to talk to people who really are on the journey, right? Yeah. On the journey and, and, and living it. And it's us. It. Yeah. It's us. See, you know, as little, little, little girls, you know, little, little boys, little girls, you know, sometimes we need just the right comfort, you know, or the right thing said to us that, you know, could, could change our trajectory, you know, or really help us in a moment, not hold on to whatever sometimes we hold on to, which, which creates, um, you know, like a sealing off of, 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 of energy. Yeah. Because either shame or whatever it sure. is, um, if you could be the, if you could tell your little girl something that you really do address the different people in you because they are in you mm. and they're mm. sometimes leading the way. Child, I. What I have done is, I know from my photos, I know what I looked like, I know what I was wearing. I've taken that child and I have held her. And, and I've talked to her and I've soothed her. You sort of go into a meditation, but she's there. Mm. You call her into you and you can physicalize her. Mm. Wherever the age it was that was, challenge for mm -hmm. you uh, and talk to her and say I'm sorry I wasn't there to help because now I'm an adult but and now you're an adult but you weren't then and that child needs an adult to say I'm sorry I wasn't there I'm here now mm -hmm. I'm here now because she's real She's real and she's running our life. If we let her. She doesn't want to run our life. Right. She doesn't want to be chairman of the board of General Motors. She wants to be she heard. She wants to be a little girl. And you hold her and you soothe her and you s apologize, say, I'm, I wasn't there when you were going through it. But I'm here now. And let it go. I can take it. I can take it on. You give it to me. Beautiful. And you talk to her as though she's real because she is real. She's real. She's running our lives. She doesn't want that responsibility. She wants to be part of it. Right. I take my kid with me sometimes to go to work if it's a fun scene, you know. I used to do these, in, these uh, meditations with Lazarus, and I, she taught us to bring in the child. Yeah. And she'd sit, I'd put her down there. This is the first time I met him and had done these seminars with him. And it was at that first seminar. There were only 30 of us in those days that were allowed because it was in a little house. And um, Here in L.A.? No, it was up in Mill Valley in okay. those days. Mm -hmm. And I, I did doubt. I, I was afraid that I wasn't getting it. And I wanted to be a serious actress and, and um, Lazarus passed these things around to all 30 of us. And they had like a hundred quotations. He said, 
all of you just close your eyes pick a number and that's your higher self talking to you wow and i thought oh dear i'm not going to do the right number you know yeah he said sharon yes lazarus number 99 and I read it and it said, angels fly because they take themselves lightly. Oh. And I now have that in an oil painting oh, that's in my beautiful. house. Because I was so intense on doing yeah. it right. Yeah, which probably maybe came from I guess so Grimmie. Grimmie or whatever. You know, I, didn't, back I to wanted that. to do it right. Right, yeah. I wasn't upset, I just was intense. Right. And right. he said, Sharon, 99. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this art's going to be sort of thing. Let's move on. Right. And it's, it's whatever the number was, it said angels fly because they take themselves. Yeah, oh, that's alive. amazing. That's beautiful. You, you, you're just a very, you have a lot of like complexity to you, you know, and you've lived a big life. And, and I, and I, when I was reading the book, I was thinking like, I wonder what is it that, in your heart, like when you lay your head down on your pillow at night, like what is the thing that brings you the most joy? Like makes you feel the most connected to your life and to your creator? That you just go, oh, that felt good. My electric mattress pad. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> is that true? I turn it on. And my sheets get all toasty, and I climb in there. Oh, and, wow. Um, I don't go to bed with a negative thought. Mm. It's not conscious. I'm not that good. Right. I'm just aware of the fact that I don't go to sleep that way because I can't. I'll stay up if something bad's happening. Right. Until it's altered or held at bay. Right or something. Mm. I, I can't go to sleep if if uh, something's bad, but I just I just believe it's going to be okay. I think so too. I think so too. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. You're Thank you really so much. Terrific at what you do. Thank you so that's I'm going to lean into that and receive that. Please. I, it, it's a, it means everything to me. It's absolutely true. Absolutely true. You're brilliant at what you do. Because you have this wonderful vehicle that allows me to trust you. Totally trust. Hey. Totally trust uh, you. And uh, thank you for being so open and, and um, you know, willing willing to share who you are. We need you. We need you. <laughs> this world needs you. And so it's a big honor to, for you to share your time and share with the rest of us you, because you're powerful. Anytime you need to be reminded. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sharon Glass. Thank you all. Mwah. Thank you all. Appreciate all of you.